Behind me are a couple pear trees planted about 10 years ago, and I had the opportunity recently to plant two of the same varieties, same size. So we're gonna take a look at planting those in just a moment, and then we're gonna bounce back and take a look at how did the plants perform 10 years later? What do the pears look like? What happened with harvest? And how do we store them and take advantage of eating those pears year after year? Let's go ahead and take a look at that planting process. This is a really good sized tree to start with when you're planting fruit trees. So we've got a couple pear trees we're gonna put in, a ewer pear and the golden spice. And the thing about pear trees, you do need cross pollination. So you've gotta have two different varieties when you put them in the ground and plant. Now, if you're lucky enough to live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of fruit trees growing, you're probably gonna have good luck just planting one pear tree because in all likelihood, you'll get that cross pollination from another pear tree nearby. But here we are, we're out in a little bit of a country setting. And I think we're gonna to have to rely on these pears being planted fairly close together. The pollination relies on insects to travel back and forth in between each tree. This is a number five pot, pretty standard for fruit trees and it's container grown. A lot of fruit trees are sold bare root. You've got a little bit shorter window when you plant your tree with bare root. Bare root meaning all the soil has been taken off. The nice thing about container grown plants, you can plant them throughout the season. We're gonna go about twice the size of that pot in this hole. Give it room for a good start. This, by the way, is a really nice shovel. It's got a sawtooth on the side. If you come across roots, you can cut right through them. If I would have had one of these shovels all my life, wow, how many holes I've dug that would have been so much easier. Most research is showing that the majority of trees are planted too deep. That's not always the fault of the person planting the tree. You have to be careful with nursery stock. Sometimes it'll come in and it's just planted way too low. So what we're looking for is where you can see here where we've got that transition where it starts to get wider. There's a top root, top surface root. You don't want that to be buried too far into the ground. We'll step back, take a different look at it from a different angle and see if that looks to be about the right height. We look to be a little low, so I'm gonna add just a little bit more. There we go. Now with container grown plants as well, this one is not root bound. You've got just a little bit of the, the roots showing where they're starting to hit the side and then move over. We'll get into other examples where you've got to cut that root system apart and break those roots free from that root ball. But we're going to be real gentle on this root ball. Not much we have to do there. We'll add a little all-purpose fertilizer as we go. This is a slow release. It's good to get that fertilizer down in where the root ball is. I like to add fertilizer at the time we're planting. We are into August planting these trees and late summer into fall is an excellent time for tree planting just because you've got a warm soil condition so that plant's immediately gonna start rooting in compared to spring if you've got cool soils. It may just sit there for a while. So this will start to root in now the next couple months and then bam, spring, it'll just blast out of the gate. Part of the art of planting a tree is just growing slow enough until your partner, he gets the fence post pounder and uh, he gets to do that dirty job. So there's Dave, Dave, go ahead. Hey. If you live in a windy zone, and we are next to a coulee here, so the wind just sweeps up here. So we are staking these trees. You wanna have them tied up for about a year. And if they root in well, you can start either loosening that tree wire, or you can just take it off completely if you feel like it really set foot quickly. So tree staking is always a good idea, help that root establish. 
And the last step on our planting project, we're gonna go ahead and put some wood mulch down to help hold that moisture. We're using a Western Red Cedar, good all-purpose mulch. We tend to use more of a shredded mulch in the windy climate because it tends to hold its, hold its ground a little better. The light wood chips, they blow away. I'd recommend only going about three inches or less. If you start going up in that four, five, six inches, you can actually build a layer underneath there that starts to crust up and you'll get water that'll actually beat off that mulch over time. So stick with three inches or less. A vinyl tree guard is also a really good idea, especially going into fall and winter. You can get mice and voles that can feed on the bark. They're attracted to it. Deer can also rub up against the plant and cause a lot of damage and sun scald. That would be the final reason you want to put a tree guard on through the winter. That sun can reflect off the snow and act just like a mirror and heat up and cause a frost crack on your tree. So we're gonna leave this off for now. We'll let the homeowner go ahead and put that on when it comes time to button down for the winter. But what a great tree, about 25 feet tall is how tall these can get. About 15 foot width, maybe 20 foot width. So, you know, a medium sized trees, very hardy, very tough tree. It'll take the dry conditions and just a solid performer. And boy, do we have a set of fruit this year. We'll zoom in closer here, but look at that. This thing is just absolutely loaded with pears. Now the pears we're growing here in the northern regions, they don't get nearly as large as something you're gonna find in the grocery store like the Bartlett pears, probably about a third of the size, maybe even just a little bit less. But the flavor and the taste are incredible. It only took about four to five years before we had our first really good harvest on the pears. And then we've had a couple rest years in between, but I've noticed that a lot of times the pears, they don't ripen on the tree right away. So the wind will come up, it'll knock them down. And if you take a look here, that's where I've actually harvested, I would say 50% of the pears that we've used. Once they hit the ground, then they start ripening up and you've got about a five day period, maybe a week that you gotta get them picked or they're gonna start rotting out on you. Now the best way I've found to enjoy your pears years later is to dehydrate them and then vacuum seal them in these jars. We'll take a look at dehydrating in another video. You know, hit subscribe, that notification button if you're interested in that. But let's go ahead and open up something we've stored now since back to 2017. This is the Ewer pear. We'll keep it close to the microphone, see if we can hear that freshness. Yeah. Yeah, so no sugar, nothing added to them. It's a time-consuming process to slice them up since they're such a small fruit. But they're still excellent. You know, five years later, the sweetness is incredible. So what a great snack, rather than some of the processed sugars, to go ahead and enjoy the produce that you can grow. If you can't fit a pear tree on your property, you know, stop by the farmer's markets. Get some of that fresh fruit, dehydrate it. Great way to go. Thanks for watching. Garden Hike, we'll see you again next time. Mm. Oh my gosh, these are so good. I could eat the whole jar.